Well, as Lee mentioned, I'm the uh, director of the university's new natural gas initiative, and I hope to make it clear to you at the beginning of my talk why the university has a new natural gas uh, initiative. And I want to talk about natural gas as a bridge fuel to a decarbonized energy future. You know, there's no longer a debate about where we're going. The only question is how we get there. And um, I want to talk about natural gas, global warming, and air pollution, hydro why we use hydraulic fracturing, and some of the environmental impacts of shale gas development. And I want to focus on earthquake triggering. It's something I've been working on a lot lately, and it's very much in the news. Now, this is a slide I like to show students your students. And the point of this slide is, you know, the best estimate is that by mid-century, we are going to need about twice as much net energy as we use today. Okay, now we have to provide this energy while respecting the desire for economic growth, especially in the developing world, by reducing the environmental impacts of energy use, by conforming to societal norms, and by acknowledging uh, national security interests around the world, which often involve access to affordable energy. So if the scale of this problem, of doubling the size of the energy system, while respecting these you know, very realistic concerns, does not scare you, intimidate you, get your attention, something's wrong. It is a huge challenge, okay? And it's gonna take um, everything we can uh, to meet these needs and to provide something between nine and 10 billion people with the energy they need to lead um, uh, the kinds of life uh, they have every reason to aspire to lead. Now this is where natural gas comes in because over the past decade, it's been demonstrated that there is, in fact, about 200 years of natural gas. This is, you know, by sort of 2010, 2012 consumption levels, okay? So there's a lot of natural gas that we now can extract and make available for use. And we've known for a very long time that if you're using natural gas for electricity, uh, you know, this, this is the amount of CO2 generated by using coal burning power plants for electricity and with natural gas, you actually get um, less than half when you actually go through the system. The efficiency of combustion is so much greater and the associated pollutants overall are so much fewer that natural gas is a logical alternative to coal. And in fact, these natural gas resources in the United States and the switching from coal to natural gas is seeing CO2 uh, emissions uh, reduced really remarkably. Um, they're, they're down to levels not seen for 25 years and going down. Now, energy efficiency has had a big role. Renewables um, are you know, becoming a more and more important part of the energy mix. But the big driver here is switching from coal to natural gas. Now, this table shows that, you know, there's a lot of other things, socks and knocks and particulates that are, you know, very uh, minor uh, associated with natural gas as compo compared to coal. And this has a huge effect in areas in the developing world that are highly reliant on coal, such as China. And this is uh, Shanghai in January. I hope you can see it. It's back there somewhere. Uh, um, and it's not just in, 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 uh, in China and India and these countries where this is a severe problem. The U.S. is, is spending something like $60 billion a year on coal-related health issues. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, young people like yourselves can deal with these issues in sort of a, both a practical and humorous way, but it's a really serious, it's a really serious issue. And, uh, far more serious than just restricting the, uh, the discussion to is, is uh, natural gas better than coal uh, for making electricity. Um, if you look at China, uh, this shows kind of China's energy use uh, doubling 
by uh, 2035, and you know, it's, things are a little slow in China, but, but the long-term picture is pretty clear. The gray bar, the numbers don't really matter, the gray bar shows you the coal use, and the coal use is expected to double. And, you know, China is emitting now seven gigatons of CO2 per year, and, um, you know, if they're emitting 14 gigatons a year at mid-century, it's sort of game, ho game over with respect to greenhouse gases and, uh, and the, any hope at all of stabilizing uh, global warming. So this is, you know, this is something we cannot allow to happen. Now, who are we to allow anything? What we have to do is create alternatives that are viable and alternatives that are practical and alternatives that meet those four criterion that I laid out in the previous slide. Let me just say one word about CO2 sequestration. Um, you know, the great hope is that we don't have to do anything. We just, business as usual, and then we encourage, you know, guys like Mike to get off their crutches and get busy and make solar just that much more um, available as fast as possible. Wind, uh, many of us hope for a, uh, a, a nuclear renaissance, okay? Yes, we have to do all that. But if you look at the numbers, it's gonna take many decades for, for this energy transition to occur. And natural gas can, can make a big impact and buy us time for a few decades as the renewable portfolio becomes more and more significant and more and more uh, sort of carrying the load of global energy needs. As I said, it's not just a matter of switching from dirty fuel to clean fuel. We have to switch from dirty fuel to clean fuel and double the size of the system simultaneously. That's a really hard thing to do. Now, in 2005, natural gas was just an old hydrocarbon that was kind of, you know, supplies were declining everywhere. It really wasn't on the horizon. And it really did look like we were gonna be stuck with coal until we could replace it with renewables. So how do you clean up coal? Well, you put scrubbers on to try to take care of the, the socks and the knocks and catch the particulates um, as best you can. Um, and then you capture the CO2 and you store it in some geologic formation at depth. Um, it's an enormous endeavor. When you talk about, um, say, a, a gigaton of carbon, one-seventh or one-eighth of what we don't want to admit emit in the future, um, you're talking about 31 billion barrels of this supercritical CO2. 31 billion barrels is very close to global oil production. So imagine all the wells and all the countries and all the pipelines and all the ships and all the terminals that have been developed over the past 100 years, that's the scale of the endeavor to reduce emissions by one-seventh or one-eighth using geologic sequestration. There's a lot of CO2 that has to be put away. And um, my colleague, a professor in the Earth Systems Department, Steve Gorelick, and I wrote a paper pointing out that not only was this, you know, a very big, costly, and difficult endeavor, it might be impossible because of the potential for earthquake triggering by injecting such large quantities in the subsurface. Yet, you know, you got, you know, if you look at this geologic cross-section, this might be uh, what's called a saline aquifer. Just think of it as a, a sandstone um, and lots of voids, and it's full of salt water. So it has no economic value at all. It can't be you know, pumped to the surface and used by people or for irrigation. It has no economic value. They're ubiquitous around the world. But the key point is that it's filled with salt water. So it's not that there are giant voids that we can fill. By pumping in CO2, we raise the pressure, and as I'll show you in a minute, by raising the pressure in the subsurface, it leads to faulting. So uh, CO2 sequestration is a good thing, okay? CO2 used for enhanced oil recovery is fine. Every molecule of CO2 we don't emit to the atmosphere is good, but I frankly don't think it's gonna operate at a scale that it's gonna be one of the principal solutions to the greenhouse gas problem. Okay, when you look at countries like China, when you look at the global impact of all this, it's really important to recognize that these 
shale gas, and I'll describe what the word shale means, these unconventional gas resources that are now being developed are located. China has enormous quantities potentially, as does a number of other countries uh, highly reliant right now on coal. South Africa, for example, Australia, for example, a number of countries in South America, uh, for example. So what are these shales? These are sedimentary rocks, rocks that are produced by a combination of erosion um, from the surface and deposition in the ocean and precipitation and uh, dying microorganisms, phytoplankton in the ocean, and they get buried out here on the continental shelf in relatively deep water, which means that the sediments are very fine-grained. So it's these, these phytoplankton, when they die, they get buried so fast by mud that they actually don't oxidize. The organic matter is trapped in these rocks. And then over geologic time, as it's buried deeper and it heats up, these dead fossils, mostly fossil plants floating in the, floating in the ocean, uh, when these, <clears throat> this organic matter you know, gets heated up, buried and heated up, it converts to something called kerogen. Kerogen is sort of a waxy organic substance. Okay? And these rocks are actually um, the source rocks for all conventional hydrocarbons. So this, this natural gas revolution is based on geologic formations that have been known about forever. It's not a surprise. What is new is the ability to actually extract the hydrocarbon from the source rocks themselves and not from a, a reservoir. Normally what happens, the conventional oil industry is based on the fact that these rocks over geologic time, the fluids come out of these rocks and they accumulate in some high permeability material and then you drill into that and you pump it out. Now what we're talking about is producing directly uh, from the source rock. And this gives you an idea of the difficulty. So this is an SEM. This little lens right there is kerogen. This is from the Eagleford Shale. This is a very hot development area on the, uh, in South Texas on the border with Mexico. If you zoom in a little bit, you can see the scales, 10 microns. You might be able to see a few small pits. And if you zoom in more, these are holes. These are the pores in the kerogen through which the gas flows. So the gas is flowing through pores that are, these are very big pores. This is an unusually permeable sample uh, that are about 100 nanometers in size. They're extremely small pores. And this leads to the fact that the permeability, the ability for fluids to move through these rocks is a million times smaller than in a conventional reservoir, okay? So this is the challenge. This is why it's never been done before, is that these rocks have the organic material, they have the hydrocarbons, but the permeability is so extraordinarily low, it could never be produced economically. Until three, you know, three technologies came along. Horizontal drilling, multi-stage hydraulic fracturing, and the use of low viscosity fracking fluids. I'm not gonna go into this in great detail, but now they, they frack basically with water. And as the hydraulic fracture propagates, the water pressure affects the surrounding rock, and you get tiny little microseismic events. These indicate shearing on faults. They're tiny little earthquakes, approximately magnitude minus two. It's a logarithmic scale. But to give you a sense, the faults that slip are about a meter in size. They slip about a tenth of a millimeter. The amount of energy release is about the same as a gallon of milk falling off a kitchen counter. You don't even know what's happening unless you put seismometers at depth. And in fact, in this case, there was a horizontal well at greater depth, and those regularly spaced green dots are, are the seismometers used to detect these tiny little microseismic events. And these three technologies, which had all been around, but used in combination, are, you know, is, is responsible for producing economic quantities of natural gas. After the natural gas prices collapsed, the oil industry recognized, well, we, we, you know, there are a lot of really crappy oil reservoirs out there, reservoirs that have been discovered 
but the permeability was so low they weren't economic. So then everything switched. They, instead of drilling for natural gas, they were drilling for oil. And at $100 a barrel, that industry was just going extremely strong. Um, the, uh, do I have that? No, I left that slide out. Um, U.S. oil production in 2014 re was the same as 1972. And since 72, oil production had been declining steadily. And 25 years of, you know, what, 33 years of decline had been completely offset in less than five years by simply going to these old oil fields and going into these poor quality reservoirs and, you know, using horizontal drilling and multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. It's just had a, a huge, huge impact. Now with the collapse of oil prices, everything's being, you know, reevaluated in terms of, you know, at what, at what cost can we actually proceed? And that's a complicated story. And uh, as you might imagine, those costs vary from place to place. But there's no question that horizontal drilling and multi-stage hydraulic fracturing uh, are large-scale industrial processes. And they're, they've gotten extremely efficient. A well that used to take six weeks to drill can be drilled in six days. They, they get a pad like this. They bring in all the drilling equipment. They might drill six wells about a mile long in one direction, six wells in the opposite direction. And so by moving the equipment once and going to one place, you don't drill one well, you don't carry out one frack, you drill 12 wells, and each well is fracked 20 times on average today. So you move out all the drilling equipment, then you move in the fracking equipment, which is what you see here, and then you do 240, 250 hydrofracks without moving any of the equipment. It's gotten extremely efficient to do this. But there are large-scale environmental consequences as well. And um, I recently wrote a paper for The Bridge, which is sort of the periodical of the National Academy of Engineering, with Doug Arendt, who's um, at the National Renewable uh, uh, Energy Lab in, in, in Colorado. And we address some of the community issues, some of the atmospheric issues, some of the land issues, and some of the water issues. And there really are issues. But, you know, if you look at this as an engineer, every industrial process has environmental issues. And it's a matter of identifying those issues and taking the steps necessary to minimize them. And so far, there's been no showstoppers. And there's, you know, there's really nothing preventing us from going forward. Uh, Lee mentioned this uh, DOE uh, panel I was on. And uh, seven of us, here's some advice. If you ever want to form a committee to get something done, make sure it's a small committee, OK? There were seven of us with very diverse backgrounds. We had the president of the Environmental Defense Fund, Fred Krupp, and we had the chairman of the Petroleum Engineering Department at Texas A&M, uh, Steve Holditch. And our chairman was John Deutsch, the former chairman, uh, a former director of the CIA. So they all know how to get things done, but have very different perspectives. Um, and it was the unanimous recommendation to the president of the committee that there was simply no question that shale gas could be developed in an environmentally responsible manner. That's the only, you know, that's what he asked us to look at, and we gave him an unequivocal answer. But, there's always a but, we made 20 recommendations on things that needed to be improved. The fact that it could be developed in an environmentally responsible manner didn't mean it always was being developed in an environmentally responsible manner. And I think if we did this today, there'd probably be 30 recommendations and not 20, as more issues has, you know, have arisen. So there are real issues out there, but they're, they're, you know, they're knowable and they're uh, solvable. Uh, let me just tell you one issue in particular, and the, it's the issue of well construction. Now, I know you can't see this table, but what it is is the result of a study of resources for the future and they went around and they asked industry, NGOs, academics, government, and industry people, what did they think the biggest problem was 
you know, likely to be when you know, they were developing these resources. And they came up with lots of potential problems. But at the top of everyone's list here in red are issues related to well construction. So the real issue isn't caused by hydraulic fracturing. President Obama and former EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson you know, have stated there's never been a case in which hydraulic fracturing has contaminated a, 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 a near surface aquifer. Okay. Never. But there are contaminated near surface aquifers in areas of development and that's caused by poor well construction. And we know how to build wells properly, we know how to case them, we know how to cement them, but it's not always done as well as it needs to be, to be done. So, well construction, well construction, well construction. So it's because of this enormous potential for natural gas to play a critical role in our energy future, to buy us time as we decarbonize over the next few decades, and the associated issues associated with them, whether we're concerned about global markets and finance, uh, how natural gas is used, of course it's used widely in petrochemicals, um, used for space heating, of course. Um, you know, it's, it's revolutionized. Uh, it's, you know, fertilizers, plastic manufacturing, and you know, U.S. was importing PVC. Now it's the world's largest exporter in just a couple of years. Um, of course, the environmental issues, uh, issues related to more efficient resource development, um, and so on. You know, we have started here at Stanford this natural gas initiative which spans the entire range of expertise of the many uh, brilliant scholars that we have here on campus. And there are many ways to engage this problem. And what we basically want to do is optimize the natural gas ecosystem from development to use um, and everything in between so that it can play this important role as the bridge fuel um, to the future. And now with, with Brad's help, uh, we're engaging a, quite a number of people. We have um, about 10 research projects that are going on, everything from economics to uh, better hydraulic fracturing, uh, a lot on environmental impacts, um, and so on. And uh, it's really, uh, it's nice to be able to contribute to the efforts uh, across a, a, a broad spectrum uh, here on campus. But there have been a number of earthquakes uh, associated with natural gas development, and I want to talk about that. And we have here at Stanford a, a consortium of companies that are supporting nine professors uh, to look at this. And basically it looks like this. When you do the hydraulic fracturing, you get these tiny little magnitude minus two earthquakes that don't mean anything. In a half dozen cases, there have been larger earthquakes, like magnitude two and three earthquakes triggered, so they're widely felt, none have caused damage. And out of a couple of million frac jobs, there's maybe a dozen cases of this that have been documented. But after you hydraulically fracture, you flow back the water. It comes back to get it out of the way. About 25% of the water you inject comes back. It's very saline. And you inject it into uh, EPA class two wastewater injection wells. And there are about 40,000 of these operating in the country. Occasionally, one of these wells will intersect the deeper fracture system. The fracture system will activate a fault the subsurface and cause a larger earthquake. And that occurred in Youngstown, Ohio in 2011, Guy, Arkansas in 2011, uh, over a period of years on the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And subsequently, uh, this is from a paper I wrote in 2012, subsequently it was argued that several other cases of earthquake triggering had occurred. I want to, and, but I'm, I think, like these other environmental risks, the title of the paper was Managing the Seismic Risk Posed by These, uh, these Earthquakes. Now, to give you a sense of, of what it's like, um, here's the uh, background seismicity rate in the central and eastern United States. All these uh, black dots are earthquakes that just occurred naturally over time. Um, that's the background rate, and that's what's happened in the last five years. It's just off the charts. If you look at Oklahoma, all of these red earthquakes, all these red symbols are earthquakes in the last five years. And this is the earthquake rate. This is 2009 in Oklahoma. 
the background rate of magnitude four earthquakes. Magnitude four means it's widely felt, but really doesn't cause any damage. The background rate until 2009 of magnitude four earthquakes was one per decade. In the first half of 2015, there was one every 11 days. Now, we live on top of the San Andreas Fault. And if we had a magnitude four earthquake here every 11 days, I would move. Okay. It's, it's incredible how, and the great majority of the residents of Oklahoma feel this. So I get asked, and I've got to wrap things up here, from time to time, because of all the earthquakes caused by fracking in Oklahoma, should we ban fracking in California? It's kind of like the question, you know, are you still beating your wife? You know, it's, there's, um, you'll meet Mary Lou tonight. There's no way that would ever happen. But, you know, you don't answer that question. And in fact, in the case of Oklahoma, it's not fracking that's causing the earthquakes. And so we've recently published a paper that describes what's happening, and I'll just give you the bottom line and leave out the details. Because oil was $100 a barrel, some very clever oil companies started to produce from formations that produced a lot of water along with the oil. Now this isn't unusual. Water is always produced with oil. You separate it out at the surface and you re-inject the water back into that same formation with the hope of pushing more oil out. Okay? But what was different here is the amount of water that was being produced was massive. And what they did with it was they injected it deeper into this Arbuckle formation, one of these saline aquifers. And it was great. It's porous, it's permeable, it's laterally extensive. It's even under pressured, which means that the water would fall in under its own weight. They didn't even have to pump it in. But the result of what was happening was causing the pressure to build up in the Arbuckle, the pressure spread out and triggered these earthquakes, excuse me, on deeper faults. And to show you how massive, and that term is truly uh, applicable, this process is, in 2014 alone, they injected over half a billion barrels, multiply that times 42, half, if you want gallons, half a billion barrels of wastewater into this Arbuckle formation. And after several years of denial, the uh, governor and the regulators in Oklahoma now recognize what the problem is, and they're working with the operators to cut it out, to stop doing that, which means what they really need to do is cut back on the wells and whatever, waste, whatever uh, produced water they have to put it back into the formation which it came from. And they've just started that process, and we hope this uh, trial experiment that they're doing will be um, successful, and then it will be broadly applied throughout the state and this earthquake problem will go away. And just like all of these other environmental issues, you know, it's foolish to deny them. They, these are real issues, but they're, you know, things, you know, we as uh, scientists and engineers can study and we can seek remedies that are practical and we can actually realize the potential of natural gas to provide this, uh, this role that we need a fuel to provide a bridge fuel uh, so um, you know, we can start decarbonizing the system and then just continue the process and stop using natural gas in 30 or 40 years uh, or as, as soon as possible. Thank you very much.